Hello, everybody. Welcome to AAN's Virtual Resident Education Lecture Series. I am happy to introduce one of our two speakers today, Dr. Kumar Swamy. He is an assistant professor of neurology at the Neuromuscular Disorders at the University of Kentucky. He received his medical degree from Jawaharlal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research in India, following a research fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston. He completed both of his neurology residency and neuromuscular disorders fellowship at Case Western Reserve University and University Hospitals in Cleveland. He is a certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in Neurology and Neuromuscular Medicine and by the American Board of Electrodiagnostic Medicine in Electromyography. He has a clinical and research in interest in neuromuscular disorders, ALS, electromyography, and neuromuscular ultrasound. He is passionate about teaching and is deeply involved in student and trainee education. Assisting him today is also Trevor Logan, a PGY3 resident at the University of Kentucky Medical Center in Lexington, Kentucky. He received his PhD in neuroscience from the Uniformed Services University and Health Services in Bethesda, Maryland, where he studied inflammatory pathways in neurogenesis and rodent models of traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury. He then returned to medical school and received his medical degree uh, from Samuelweis University in Budapest, Hungary. He plans to pursue a fellowship in clinical neurophysiology uh, with his interest in the fields of epilepsy and neuromuscular medicine. Dr. Kumar Swamy and Dr. Logan, welcome. Thank you for being here, and I am turning this over to you. Thank you for your introduction, Ben, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Hello, everyone. Um, we will be talking about chronic immune-mediated demyelinating neuropathies today. I hope you enjoy the talk. Starting out with disclosures, we uh, were part of a clinical trial for one of the newer CIDP drugs uh, produced by Arginex, uh, but we're actually not going to talk about these newer agents at all in today's session, partly because my gut feeling is that the list of new drugs is going to evolve so quickly that what I tell you today may be outdated in two or three years by the time you graduate and start practicing. Uh, I guess we'll know if I'm right or wrong in a few years. But more seriously, um, I think an accurate diagnosis of these neuropathies that we'll talk about today, uh, while learning to avoid both type 1 and type 2 errors, will have a much larger impact both at a population level and at, and, and at a patient level than your initial choice of treatment modality, at least as far as the agents we have available today. So what's with this clunky name that I chose for this talk, chronic immune-mediated neuropathies. Why that? Why not just call it CIDP, which is a more recognizable name? So I did, I did in fact, want to call it CIDP mimics and chameleons, but uh, someone had already stolen those words for, for the title of a paper back in 2014. So we went with this instead. But more importantly, although CIDP is the most obvious of these disorders and the most well-known, uh, and we will be spending most of our time today on CIDP, I wanted to also make sure that we think of CIDP alongside other immune-related neuropathies, which don't necessarily have inflammatory pathology in the nerves, like for instance, nodopathies and paranodopathies, multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction blocks, certain other disorders which have multiple different mechanisms, immune-related and otherwise, like paraproteinemias and hematological malignancies. And we obviously won't talk in the same vein about vasculitis, which although it's vasculitic neuropathy, which although it is immune related, is an axonal neuropathy. And we won't talk about AIDP or GBS, which again, although immune related, is an acute presentation very different from CIDP. We also probably won't have time to touch on neuropathies in conditions like sarcoidosis, Sjogren syndrome, and other autoimmune conditions. So the focus is going to be on conditions which have chronic course, which means that they progress or relapse at initial presentation over a period of eight weeks or longer. They are immune mediated with multiple immune mechanisms, including cellular and humoral mechanisms. They are demyelinating, meaning the myelin is the primary locus of injury, although there often is secondary axonal loss in most of these conditions. And they affect the nerve roots, the plexuses, the peripheral nerves, or various combinations of these possible different localizations. 
Typically, they affect the peripheral nervous system in more than one of these levels. But we will talk about patterns seen in specific conditions and specific variants of CIDP in just a bit. Let's begin by looking at a few real patient examples from our neuromuscular clinic here in Lexington. Dr. Logan? I will um, present a few of these cases patient scenarios with some multiple choice options, uh, things to think about over the course of this talk. So our first scenario, um, a 53-year-old woman with type 1 diabetes presents with one to two years of gait imbalance with her HbA1c being 7.7%. She has symmetric pansensory loss below the ankles and is areflexic in all four limbs with a grade 4 out of 5 weakness of the toe movements. Electrodiagnostic studies of both lower limbs showed absent sensory responses, reduced motor amplitudes with conduction velocities of 32 meters per second, with a normal being around 40, and absent F waves. If you were managing this patient, the next best step would be A, steroid treatment for CIDP, B, lumbar puncture, C, therapeutic trial of IVIG for CIDP, D, electrodiagnostic studies of the upper limbs, or E, SCIG treatment for CIDP. So let's give everyone some time to think about the answers and feel free to put your answers in the chat if you'd like. Uh, we won't force you to, but I just want, uh, want you to have some time to really think about these options. Now, these may seem a little harder than what you're used to, say, on the right exam or on your board preps. I intended them to be that way just so that we could think about some of the issues that will come up during the rest of this talk. That way you can connect the questions here and what you thought about to what we will learn later on. And Dr. Logan, we can, as we go, we can maybe just let everybody read the options, uh, but uh, read out the question for, for everyone. Sounds good. Um, here for our second case, <clears throat> a 59 year old woman presenting with five months of weakness and numbness affecting all four limbs with diffuse areflexia on the exam. Electrodiagnostic studies show segmental slowing in three motor nerves in the left upper and lower limbs and decreased sensory amplitudes sparing the cerebral nerve. So which of these features, if present, would raise the most concern for a diagnosis other than CIDP? The clinical details are really boiled down to just the, just the essentials of what we're trying to drive home here. So I'll give you a moment to... All right, moving on to our... Third patient example. All right, here in our third case, a 43-year-old man had weakness, numbness, and hyporeflexia that developed over a two-year period. His deficits were asymmetric and worse in the upper limbs. His upper limbs improved with IVIG. His lower limbs have not improved in spite of the treatment for the last four years. He continues to need, continues to need ankle braces to walk. Electrodiagnostic studies show absent sensory responses and reduced motor amplitudes in the lower limbs. Motor conduction velocities are reduced to 42 meters per second with normal being about 50 in the upper limbs and they're reduced to 32 meters per second with normal being about 40 in the lower limbs. And what would be the next best step in management? Okay, so same thing again. I'll give you a minute to go through all the options and hold on to your thoughts your questions about what you see in the case scenario here what you think the correct answer should be hold on to all those thoughts because we're going to come back to them at the end of the talk okay and our last patient example last one a 49 year old man with hypertension and nephrotic syndrome on steroids presents with weakness and numbness in the distal lower limbs for three months, spreading to the proximal lower limbs and the hands over the next two months, in spite of IVIG given for suspected CIDP. He's areflexic with gait ataxia, orthostasis, and length dependent sensory and motor deficits. Electrodiagnostic studies show conduction slowing, conduction blocks, and pathological temporal dispersion in the bilateral upper limb motor nerves with absent snaps. And this specific diagnosis would most likely be confirmed by what? Okay. 
And SNAPs for the PGY1s and maybe PGY2s among you are sensory nerve action potentials. So basically the sensory responses on an electrodiagnostic study. So I'll give you a moment to read through the options here. All right, so I hope I hope you um, are able to remember these four somewhat different patient presentation scenarios through to the end of the talk, and we'll come back to them in just a bit. So like I said, among these chronic immune-mediated neuropathies, which are demyelinating, we'll start by talking about CIDP first. So CIDP, as some of you know, is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. So as the name suggests, it affects nerve roots, but also affects the peripheral nerves themselves. As you can see, it's, it's really a pretty rare disease, although the estimation of the true incidence and prevalence is hampered by both underdiagnosis and overdiagnosis of CIDP. Unfortunately, these are quite frequent, as we'll see in just a bit. So what does CIDP most often look like in terms of its clinical presenting features? What we used to call typical CIDP and is now just called CIDP as per the latest EAN PNS guidelines. So typically it presents as a mostly symmetric peripheral neuropathy. Although if you look really, really close, even in patients who present with a symmetric presentation, you may find mild asymmetries in exam or asymmetries on electrodiagnostic studies, but mostly it's a symmetric presentation. It involves the motor and the sensory nerves. It has both proximal and distal involvement, contrasting with the length-dependent involvement that you would see, for instance, with diabetic neuropathy. So typical CIDP, as it used to be called, has both proximal and distal involvement. And these patients are either areflexic or hyporeflexic in all four limbs. You probably noticed one symptom that's prominently missing from our list, which is pain. And that's because pain tends not to be a major presenting symptom, although some patients may have a degree of neuropathic pain later in the disease. Lastly, typical CIDP can sometimes have a more acute onset when it's called ACIDP or acute CIDP, you could argue that makes it somewhat atypical. But this CIDP, it appears indistinguishable from other patients with the more chronic presentation of CIDP in any other way once it becomes clear that it isn't AIDP based on the initial clinical course. So it has more similarities to CIDP than to AIDP. Okay, so that's what, what was previously called typical CIDP looks like. But not all CIDP looks the same. And we now know of several well-established variants of CIDP, which all have their own unique features. These used to be labeled atypical CIDP, but now we know they are their own type. So you can't call them atypical anymore. They're just variants. You love it when a, when a group of experts get so passionate about what they're doing that even the semantics have so much reasoning behind them. Anyway, talking about variants, we have MADSAM or multifocal CIDP. MADSAM stands for Multifocal Acquired Demyelinating Sensory and Motor Neuropathy. It, it's also called the Lewis Sumner variant or LSS. It's often asymmetric compared to typical CIDP. It tends to be upper limb predominant more than CIDP. It can involve the cranial nerves more often than other variants and more than typical CIDP. I'm using the word typical just to distinguish the variants from CIDP, but just again, remember that the EAN PNS guidelines don't use the word typical, they just call it CIDP now. So those are a couple of ways in which multifocal CIDP differs from CIDP. But in terms of treatment response, they are quite similar, although maybe there is a slight, um, slightly poorer prognosis compared to CIDP for multifocal CIDP. Not dramatically different, though. Moving on, um, there is focal CIDP, where multifocal 
by definition should involve at least two limbs, but focal CIDP may only involve one limb. So that's how they both differ from typical CIDP, which affects all four limbs. Focal CIDP also includes what previously used to be called CIDM or chronic inflammatory demyelinating mononeuropathy. This again is quite similar to typical CIDP in its presentation, except for the fact that it only involves one limb. So the chronicity is similar. The fact that motor and sensory nerves are both involved is similar. The fact that both proximal and distal muscles are affected is similar and treatment response rates are also similar. Moving on to distal CIDP or what's called DADS for distal acquired demyelinating symmetric neuropathy. So this variant of CIDP can be idiopathic, which in which it's not associated with any M proteins. And this variant is called DADS I for DADS idiopathic. And that behaves more or less similar to CIDP in terms of treatment response. But DADS can also be associated with monoclonal gammopathy with IgM and sometimes with anti-MAG IgM antibodies. With, when it's associated with the IgM monoclonal gammopathy, it's called DADS-M. And several of those patients also have anti-MAG antibodies when it's called anti-MAG neuropathy because it's, it has its own phenotype. And DADS-M and anti-MAG anti neuropathy both have a much, much poorer treatment response compared to CIDP, especially with conventional agents like steroids and IVIG, and may have a slightly better response to rituximab. The next type of CIDP we'll talk about is motor CIDP, where, as the name suggests, the patient presents with motor symptoms and signs with a distribution similar to that of typical CIDP. If sensory conduction studies are abnormal, but the patient has no sensory symptoms, then we would call it motor predominant CIDP. Obviously, motor CIDP invites comparison to MMN or multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction blocks, which is a slowly evolving motor neuropathy, which is often associated, as the name suggests, with demyelination and conduction blocks. But it also has an association, MMN has an association with IgM neuropathy antibodies to GM1 ganglicide. And this is thought to be a separate entity from motor CIDP, since the path pathophysiology involves antibodies to this GM1 nodal paranodal protein, although it also has a good response to IVIG. Both motor CIDP and this, this somewhat clinically similar condition, MMN, although it's classified separately, both have a good response to IVIG, and both may show a lack of response or sometimes a decline with steroids. So that's important to know. And the last subtype or variant of CIDP we will talk about is sensory CIDP, which tends to be mostly distal. In this uh, latest revision of the EAN PNS guidelines for CIDP, they excluded CISP or CISP, which is chronic inflammatory sensory polyradiculopathy from sensory CIDP, although they both respond to IVIG similarly to typical CIDP. So that's about the CIDP variants. Why do we need to know about all these variants? Why don't we just lump them all into CIDP and not bother classifying them by phenotype? So well, for one, it's, it, it's, it is possible that based on the clinical phenotype, there are slightly different pathophysiological mechanisms between these variants. And also it's important to know because these variants are more prone to misdiagnosis as we, will see, as we will see shortly. All the clinical features of CIDP and its variants that we just discussed, this is what forms the basis for the EAN PNS guidelines. Um, it's an excellent paper that I would recommend you, you all read if you have a chance. So once the diagnosis of CIDP is suspected based on the clinical presentation, we move on to the usual next step, which is electrodiagnostic testing. In the EAN PNS guidelines, there are very strictly defined criteria for what qualifies as an abnormality suggestive of CIDP and what doesn't 
But basically, we're looking for definitive demyelinating features that are not explained by entrapment neuropathies. I'm assuming most of you know what axonal features versus demyelinating features on electrodiagnostic studies are. But just to recap really quickly, the axons, the wires inside your nerves, they uh, conduct action potentials. So loss of axons would reduce the amplitude of the recorded response on electrodiagnostic studies. Whereas myelin helps saltatory conduction and speeding up conduction. So problems of myelin would affect the speed of conduction, which means latency and velocity on your electrodiagnostic studies. So what are some of these criteria that are strictly defined? So there's motor latency prolongation, and this prolongation has to be more than 50% of the upper limit of normal for each nerve. So it's a very strict criterion. The motor conduction velocity has to be reduced to less than 70% of the lower limit of normal for us to be convinced that there is demyelination going on in that segment. Conduction blocks are another feature of demyelination, which is defined as a 30% or more amplitude drop between a distal and a proximal segment of a nerve. Pathological temporal dispersion, which is increase in the CMAP duration, the motor response duration between a distal and a proximal stimulation site by more than 30% is again a feature of demyelination. And prolonged distal CMAP duration more than well-defined normative values for each specific motor nerve is also a feature of demyelination. So, so far you'll notice that we've only talked about motor abnormalities, which is what the electrodiagnostic criteria are heavily weighted towards. Although some abnormalities in F waves like absent or delayed F waves and sensory conduction abnormalities, which may include both decreased amplitude and prolonged latencies with slowed velocities, as well as specific features like sural sparing, also qualify to support the CIDP diagnosis. Now, the specific uh, ways in which you can combine these criteria to get to a diagnosis of possible CIDP or CIDP are all in the paper that I told you about. But from a conceptual standpoint, this is what you uh, this is what will be useful to remember. So basically, combining the clinical and the electrodiagnostic findings these uh, criteria will get us to a diagnosis of CIDP or of possible CIDP with a classification into the specific variant. In spite of all this, electrodiagnostic studies have some frustrating limitations. For instance, nerves may be inexcitable due to extremely thick um, repeated uh, myelin loss and uh, uh, recovery and cycles of that going on and on again and again or due to axon loss, which can be secondary to the demyelination. So it may be hard to distinguish a primary axonal pathology from a primary demyelinating pathology. Also, demyelinating features may be very proximal, meaning in the upper arm or near, near the brachial plexus in the upper limb, or in the lumbosacral plexus or in the proximal thigh in the lower limbs, regions that we don't normally stimulate and study with our typical, uh, with our usual conduction studies. So they may be hard to identify if they're very proximal. Demyelination can also be extremely distal with severe conduction blocks, which can sometimes mimic axonal loss pathology. And often CIDP overlaps with other conditions, fairly common conditions like diabetic, diabetic neuropathy, which can confound your interpretation of the EMG. So part of the reason why it's really important to study upper limb nerves on uh, patients where you suspect CIDP is that diabetic neuropathy, which is a length-dependent neuropathy, is a common comorbidity or even a misdiagno misdiagnosis that uh, is often is often labeled CIDP. Okay, so given the limitations of the electrodiagnostic testing, we do have some of the tests which may identify abnormalities that support a diagnosis of CIDP. For instance, there's nerve imaging by nerve ultrasound or MRI, which tend to show a heterogeneous enlargement of the nerves in CIDP. We'll talk a bit more about ultrasound in a second. There's CSF analysis, where you may find high protein and very rarely increased cells, usually lymphocytic. CSF is 
helpful mostly to exclude other diagnosis rather than confirm CIDP because these findings are not specific for CIDP. They also have to be interpreted carefully in the extremes of age or in diabetes where protein may be slightly elevated. There's also uh, some utility in some of the uh, other conditions related to CIDP that we'll discuss, like nodopathies and paranodopathies, where you, have, you may have an extremely high protein in the CSF. Then we have nerve biopsy, which is a which tends to show early on in the disease segmental demyelination of nerves on teased fiber preparations, which almost nobody does anymore. And later on, it tends to show onion bulbs due to cycles of demyelination and remyelination happening over time. This is rarely routinely performed anymore. It's only considered when the diagnosis remains unclear from the other tests and possibilities like vasculitic neuropathy or sarcoidosis or other things need to be ruled out. The last supportive criterion is an objective response to immune therapy, which really it has to be objective. It cannot be a vague improvement of, oh, the patient feels better or I have less pain. It can't be that. It has to be objective improvement in terms of MRC scores or specific CIDP rating scales or on electrodiagnostic testing. Apart from these tests that can help support a diagnosis of CIDP, there's also usually additional testing that's recommended for most patients with suspected CIDP that includes checking for paraproteins, ruling out diabetes, basic chem panels and blood counts, as well as in some patients where the phenotype fits, consideration of some advanced testing such as vascular endothelial growth factor that may be uh, that may help confirm a diagnosis of POEMS syndrome or nodal paranodal antibodies that we'll talk about a bit. A word about ultrasound and CIDP, as I said, there's now quite a lot of literature describing abnormalities on ultrasound and CIDP. It tends to show a mixed which is heterogeneous hypo and hyperechoic enlargement of nerves because the portions involved by chronic inflammation and demyelination and remyelination end up becoming hyperechoic, whereas the actively inflamed parts may appear slightly hypoechoic. This hypoechoic enlargement can sometimes be fascicular, meaning only certain fa fascicles within a nerve can be affected, unlike in an entrapment neuropathy where you tend to see the entire nerve get affected. And it turns out that uh, now with the technology currently available and the normative values that are now well defined for the upper limb nerves, ultrasound may actually be better than MRI for confirmation of CIDP. Before we talk about uh, how to treat CIDP, moving on from diagnosis of CIDP, let's first talk about when to treat CIDP. This is really important because CIDP is treated with immune modulating treatments, which aren't without their own serious risks, and they're certainly not cheap. So it's important only to treat as CIDP if the diagnostic criteria are met. Now, there may be clinical situations where you have to use the immune therapy as a therapeutic trial to see if a patient responds or not, in which case, that would be fine, but it's important to limit the exposure to no more than three to four doses of IVIG and have an objective reassessment after those many doses. And if there is no improvement, it's important not to pursue further treatment unless the diagnosis of CIDP is really confirmed by other means. So in patients where the diagnosis is in doubt, then a therapeutic trial of CIDP may be considered, but should be used in a very objective and limited fashion. It's also important, even in confirmed CIDP, to treat only if there is progression of disease and disability. There really isn't any evidence that CIDP helps residual deficits that are attributable to axon loss or neuropathic pain in patients who have had CIDP for several years and have remained stable in terms of their disability. Apart from immunotherapy, there's also obviously symptomatic management, which we won't touch upon much today. So the specific treatment options, there is initial treatment of CIDP and maintenance, 
The most well-known is probably IVIG, which is usually started at a dose of two grams per kg IV dosed over five days, followed by one gram per kg given every three to four weeks to begin with. And then there is steroids. There are multiple different regimens described for steroids, continuous regimens, which can be oral or IV, as well as pulse regimens, which are described for CIDP. And they seem to be more or less equivalently effective. Then there is plasmapheresis, which is also an, a proven treatment for CIDP, although it rarely is a first option since IVIG and steroids are far more easily available and probably a little less morbid. There's also rituximab for patients who are refractory to the other three options that can be used for initial induction of treatment. In practice, we would usually start with either IVIG or steroids, depending on what is available and the patient's severity and their comorbidities. And depending on the effectiveness and the patient response to the first, to one of the first two treatments, we would then go down the list, adding other agents or substituting the first agent for another if it's completely ineffective. So for instance, if you started with IVIG and it's completely ineffective, you might think of going to pulse steroids or to plasmapheresis. If you started with IVIG and it's partly effective, you may think of adding on steroids. So various different combinations of these regimens can be made. But generally, it's recommended to pursue monotherapy if there is no response at all to the initial treatment. It's recommended not to add on subsequent therapies unless there was some positive response to the initial treatment. So monotherapy is preferred before going to combination therapy. This is, this is reasoning that you would have probably heard in other areas of medicine like epilepsy, for instance. After the patient gets an initial response to treatment, we go to maintenance therapy, which is basically continuing the initial therapy to which the patient has a good response, while gradually, over several months, lowering the dose and the frequency of treatments. We now have subcutaneous Ig or SCIG, which can be substituted for IVIG once the patient has had a good response and there is no further progression of disability. They can often be transitioned to SCIG, which is easier to dose for the patient uh, since they can do it themselves at home. There are also other adjunct immunosuppressants like azathioprine, mycophenolate, and cyclosporin if weaning from the first agent becomes unsuccessful. That's the treatment of CIDP with immune therapies. So let's move on to one of the biggest recent discoveries in the field of immune-mediated neuropathies which is that some patients with a CIDP-like presentation in some ways and CIDP-like electrodiagnostic features turn out to have antibodies to several proteins that are at and around the node of Ranvier in the peripheral nerve. So here's an illustration showing an, a single axon with its myelin and the node of Ranvier there, which is blown up here for, for us in this illustration. So this portion right here is the node between two Schwann cells. This green here is the axon under the Schwann cell. And the, the portion of, of the nerve right next to the node is called the paranode, and the portion further in is called the juxtaparanode. I'll point out some important proteins here, which are at the nodal paranodal regions. So there is NF186, which is neurofashion 186. That's a nodal protein. There is NF155, neurofashion 155, Casper 1, and contactin 1, which are paranodal proteins, which are targets for these nodal paranodal antibodies that cause CIDP-like presentations. There are also, if you notice, a couple of other proteins you might recognize the names of. So there's GM1 ganglioside and MAG or myelin associated glycoprotein. GM1 being the target of IgM antibodies in multifocal motor neuropathy and MAG being the target of IgM antibodies in MAG neuropathy, MAG antibody neuropathy rather. So why does it matter? What happens if there are antibodies to these targets? Why does this behave differently from CIDP in some ways? So what really happens is that the 
uh, immune reaction at this site ends up separating these nicely opposed myelin lamellae and causes the sodium channels at the node of Ranvier and the potassium channels in the juxtaparanode and the driving current between them gets diffused, meaning the action potential cannot jump from one node of Ranvier to the next. So removal of these myelin lamellae or separation of them from the axon causes essentially a conduction block at that site. Why does it not cause a typical CIDP? So it turns out the other reason is that these antibodies tend to be the IgG4 subtype, unlike IgG3 and IgG1 antibodies, which the IgG4 do not activate complement and do not activate the inflammatory cascade. So the CIDP, the I, the inflammation in CIDP really doesn't happen to the same degree uh, or at all in these nodal paranormal antibody mediated neuropathies. How are they clinically different from CIDP then? As a group, they may have a more subacute onset compared to the slower chronic onset of CIDP. Some of these can be associated with non-neurological symptoms, including nephrotic syndrome. And in terms of response to treatment, they may have a poor response to IVIG, a variable response to steroids, and a better response to rituximab, especially if rituximab can be used early on in the disease course. So that's why it's really important to know about these neuropathies as a separate category from CIDP. There's now a growing body of literature about specific clinical features of individual antibodies targeting specific antigens at the para node as well as at the node. So for instance, NF155 antibodies, which are the most common among these, they tend to occur in younger males. They tend to have a motor more than sensory and a distal more than proximal presentation, often associated with ataxia and tremor. Contact in one antibodies. They are similar to NF-155, but they also tend to have a lot of axonal involvement at the very onset. Then you have Casper-1 antibody, which is associated with a lot of neuropathic pain at onset, as well as a tendency to involve the phrenic nerves and cranial nerves come more, more frequently compared to CIDP. And then you have the nodal protein, which is NF-140 and 186. Antibodies to these can also involve the respiratory system and uh, can cause respiratory failure and can involve cranial nerves. So that is why we treat these nodoparanodopathies as a different group of disorders from CIDP now. Apart from those conditions, what else can mimic CIDP? What else can be mistaken for CIDP? What else do we need to consider in its differential diagnosis? So this can be quite extensive depending on the clinical context. But in this list, I have left uh, most axonal neuropathies out to keep the length of this list manageable. Looking at each one of these, for instance, where we have typical CIDP, what's just called CIDP now, the most common thing mistaken for it is probably diabetic neuropathy or diabetic radiculopathies and plexopathies. And then you have entrapment neuropathies, which can also be sometimes mistaken for CIDP by just their sheer frequency. AIDP can sometimes be a differential diagnosis for CIDP if CIDP presents in the acute or ACIDP form, but the clinical course should make it clear which one it is, meaning if there are, if the uh, relapsing or progressing nature of the disease becomes obvious beyond three months, you would really then be certain that this is indeed CIDP and not AIDP. Then we have amyloidosis, both acquired and um, inherited forms, which can sometimes mimic CIDP. Nodoparanodopathies, which we just talked about. Poem syndrome, which is polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, M protein, skin changes. So that's what POEMS stands for, is another possible mimic of CIDP. Often this, these patients look a lot sicker than CIDP patients. They have a lot of pain. They may have systemic symptoms like weight loss, and they may have a lot of axon loss at the very beginning, 
and the changes in their nerves may be more diffuse than CIDP usually is. These are caused by IgA lambda uh, paraproteins typically and are associated with osteosclerotic myelomas. Then there is canomad or chronic ataxic neuropathy with ophthalmoparesis, M protein agglutination, and disialacyl antibodies, as, as the name suggests, caused by these antibodies or associated with these antibodies. Vasculitic neuropathies, such as those related to lupus or ankyovasculitis, can mimic CIDP. HNPP, hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies, can cause multiple sites of demyelination, which can sometimes be mistaken for CIDP. Looking at the other variants of CIDP, distal CIDP can sometimes, uh, anti-mag neuropathy can sometimes be mistaken for distal CIDP, but it tends not to respond to IVIG and instead may have a slightly better response to rituximab. There are hereditary neuropathies in the Shakomari tooth family, which can be dist mistaken for distal CIDP. Sensory CIDP, we may need to consider again anti-mag neuropathy as a mimic of sensory CIDP. And of course, toxic and metabolic neuropathy, since they tend to affect sensory nerves um, before they affect motor nerves, will need to be considered as well. Motor CIDP may be mimicked by multifocal motor neuropathy and occasionally other conditions like neurologic amyotrophy and ALS. So that's the differential diagnosis of CIDP. And I think we've touched on the main two uh, conditions in addition to CIDP that I wanted to. So we'll go back to the questions that we looked at in the beginning of the talk. I've highlighted the parts that are really important and that lead us to the answer this time around. So for, uh, again, I had asked you to try and try and remember the questions that uh, uh, that were posed, as well as the clinical scenario and anything else that it makes you think of. Hopefully, we'll have about five minutes to answer questions at the end. So, this first patient was diabetic with one or two years of neuropathic symptoms, which may fit with CIDP. So, there's some concern for it. Her A1C with type one diabetes not terrible. Her clinical presentation is a distal symmetric sensory motor presentation with very mild weakness, so sensory more than motor, really. On electrodiagnostic studies that were done elsewhere, somehow both lower limbs were studied without the upper limbs being included, and the changes they saw were mild slowing of the conduction velocities. Now, if you recall what the degree of slowing required to confirm that there are demyelinating changes is on the new criteria, it is 70% or lower below the lower limit of normal. And this obviously does not make the cut. So steroid treatment in this patient would obviously not be indicated since our diagnosis of CIDP is far from confirmed and quite in doubt. And of course, steroids could worsen glycemic control. Lumbar puncture is unnecessarily invasive and it wouldn't confirm CIDP by itself. A therapeutic trial of IVIG, not at this point for sure, with the diagnosis of CIDP in doubt. What we need is upper limb studies to look at whether there is more significant slowing or conduction blocks in the upper limb nerves. This patient was actually sent to us on IVIG by the referring, um, uh, referring hospital which we obtained upper limb studies, which turned out to be normal, and then we stopped her IVIG. After a thorough workup, all other alternatives were ruled out, and her clinical picture was thought to be consistent with good old diabetic neuropathy. The patient is now off IVIG and quite stable at follow-up a year down the line. So this is important, taking patients off IVIG that don't need them so that we don't cause unnecessary morbidity. The next patient that we looked at is a 59-year-old woman who had a five-month course of progressive neuropathic symptoms. Again, mostly symmetric in presentation. On the nerve conduction studies, there was segmental slowing in multiple motor nerves in the upper and lower limbs on one side. There was also the sural sparing pattern, which is somewhat sensitive, somewhat specific for acquired demyelinating 
neuropathies. Of these, looking at the features that would make us concerned for a diagnosis that is not CIDP, motor worse than sensory involvement, well, we looked at the CIDP variant, that is the motor CIDP, right? We call it motor predominant if, if there is some sensory involvement. Again, sensory worse than motor, we know that's called sensory predominant CIDP. Upper limb worse than lower limb, we do see this in multifocal CIDP or MADSAM. Asymmetry, again, left hand being worse than the right, we do see that in MADSAM. So of all these, the thing that would raise the most concern for a diagnosis of something other than CIDP in this clinical setting would be respiratory involvement due to nodoparanodopathies. This patient actually was in the hospital before I saw her, and she was treated with plasmapheresis, which is an unusual choice. I think she had a contraindication to IVIG and to steroids. She was actually taken, uh, she was able to come off of her tracheostomy before I saw her, which was uh, two weeks after plasma exchange, but she declined again a week later. And by that time, we had the antibody result. She was then given rituximab with a more sustained improvement. She's now seven months out and is able to walk. The next patient we looked at is the 43-year-old man who had asymmetric sensory and motor deficits that developed over a period that could be consistent with CIDP. He did have IVIG that, that continued for four years, and although his upper limbs improved, his lower limbs did not. Now, Although they didn't improve, he's still able to walk with ankle braces, and there is no information in the question that tells us there is any active progression of disease or disability. He seems to have been stable for the last four years. Looking at the electrodiagnostic studies, again, the reduction in conduction velocities is not sufficient to meet the cutoff that is required for diagnosis of acquired demyelination, and he also has evidence of axon loss based on the reduced motor amplitudes in the lower limbs. So this tells us that his disease is really not active and what should be done is attempting to wean off IVIG. All the other options which would be escalations are not indicated in this case. So again, uh, the thing that this is trying to get at is that CIDP should only be treated with immune therapies if there is evidence of disease progression. I left something out of the story on purpose. This man had actually developed CKD and was taken off IVIG six months before he came to see me. And the question was, what else can we put him on for a CIDP? Since it had been six months and he had had no worsening, in addition to all these other features, which uh, also reassure us that his disease is not active, we kept him off of IVIG and he has not worsened in the last about a year or so of being off IVIG. The last one, this patient who had hypertension and nephrotic syndrome, in spite of being on steroids, presented with a somewhat rapid progression that was concerning initially for CIDP. So started in the distal lower limbs and then went to the distal upper limbs and proximal lower limbs. So he got IVIG since he was already on steroids and the diagnosis of CIDP was suspected elsewhere. He received IVIG, but without any improvement. So a lot of the red flags that we just looked at in the last few minutes, which tell us this may not be CIDP. On exam, he had some features that may be consistent with CIDP. So areflexia, ataxia, and the length-dependent deficits, but he also had autonomic involvement in the form of orthostatic hypotension. On his electrodiagnostic studies, the findings are mostly compatible with CIDP. But given all these other features and the association with nephrotic syndrome, we should think about nodal paranodal antibodies. The association with nephrotic syndrome was first uh, reported with contact in one antibodies, but now there are more reports also with neurofashion antibodies. Of the other options, ultrasound would not be specific for distinguishing between CIDP and nodal paranodopathies. Genetic testing, there is no mention of pressure palsies, so HNPP would not, would not be a consideration in his case, really. CSF examination is not really specific enough, although the nodoparanodopathies have slightly elevated protein more compared to CIDP. 
VEGF levels. We would probably obtain these, but this patient does not have pain and no other OMS symptoms. So not just the polyneuropathy, but no mention of organomegaly, endocrinopathy, M protein or skin changes. So this would be unlikely, although we would probably test for it. So the likely diagnosis is going to be confirmed by checking for antibodies. All right. This patient actually did have NF-155 antibodies and he was given rituximab. This was fairly recent. I think I saw him about four months ago uh, first for his diagnosis. And then uh, again, a couple of months later when he had had mild improvement. Interestingly, his kidney function also became normal and he's now off of steroids. So it, that's that tells us that these antibodies are probably also involved in the mechanism of the nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so that is the end of the talk, and we have seven minutes to take any questions if if anyone has them. Feel free to unmute yourself or oh, I guess I guess there isn't unmuting. So feel free to post your questions in the chat if you have any questions, any comments, anything that you want me to go back to or clarify. Yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, Kumar Swami, are you able to see the Q&A thing on Zoom or would you like me to read you some questions? I am, yes. Okay. Uh, are there questions here? Yeah, I can see the q and I don't see any questions yet. Oh, wait, I guess there's a different box here. Okay, now I see it. All right, I'll just go, I'll just go over them in order. So personal experience on the efficacy of pulse treatment with oral DEXA versus continuous prednisone. Um, I have recently begun switching in the last year and a half. I've I've begun switching all of my patients to pulse treatment, and I have not noticed any uh, big difference. And I think it is uh, there is some um, reasoning that suggests it may be less prone to causing these steroid side effects. So I've been switching all of my patients to oral DEXA. The continuous prednisone, the only thing is that it's easier to maybe titrate, uh, but you could do that easily enough with oral. It's it's not a problem. In the literature, there is some argument that the oral DEXA is marginally better if you look at the, if you, if you split hairs and look at the exact percentages of response, but I think they should be treated as more or less equivalent uh, since we don't have any, um, any good head-to-head -head comparisons. Next question here. How do you decide on when to stop treatment for CIDP? Yeah, so this this is actually uh, this can be a um, a challenging thing to decide when to stop it. We don't usually um, stop IVIG or any other immunotherapies abruptly. The typical uh, clinical course is that we start out with IVIG being given every three to four weeks. And then we can either reduce the dose of IVIG while maintaining the frequency or decrease the frequency while maintaining the dose or a combination of the two, depending on the patient's convenience. Do they want to make more trips to the infusion center? Are they having fluctuations in between uh, infusions as they, uh, as they get more spaced out? So it's a bit of trial and error. And once you get down to infusions that are between eight and 12 weeks apart, you can probably taper it off completely and see if there is evidence of uh, disease activity returning. Now, in the beginning, you would probably attempt to taper patients every three to six months. But later on, once you are down to once in every six weeks or so, you'll probably go a lot slower. So you'll probably go maybe once in every 12 months uh, to attempt to taper them. If any disease activity returns, then you would put them back on the lowest dose of IVIG that was efficacious to, uh, to keep the disease controlled. And the same logic can be applied to steroids or to other forms of treatments. And no, there are not any particular guidelines at this point. So treatment is individualized. Next question, um, do we monitor NIF and VC vital capacity along with telemetry for uh, patients with high suspicion for nodopathies and paranodopathies? Um, that, that's a good question. I think it would be worthwhile uh, checking it once at admission. Uh, and if there is uh, if there is evidence that the disease is evolving quickly while they're in the hospital, then maybe rechecking it. Unlike in myasthenia gravis, there is not a big component of um, fatigable weakness here that we need to worry about. So we probably wouldn't need to check them multiple times a day. Uh, 
but just once perhaps at admission and subsequently if there is um, either respiratory symptoms or rapid progression of disease peripherally. Next question, can you discuss expected clinical responses including the time of AIDP versus acute CIDP with IVIG? Oh, this this is a <laughs> there there isn't enough data to say how quickly acute CIDP uh, should respond to IVIG. We know from our experience with AIDP or GBS that uh, typically the response, if there is one in the patients who do respond to it, typically it starts somewhere between day seven to day fourteen, and it may peak between the second and the third week for the first dose of IVIG in AIDP. Now, there may be some patients with AIDP who have what's called a treatment-related fluctuation. So they seem to respond in, in the first uh, two to three weeks, and then maybe three or four weeks down the line, they have a decline clinically because the underlying disease process has not yet completely stopped, whereas the IgEs in their blood have now uh, disappeared. In those cases, it's hard to distinguish between AIDP and ACIDP. It could be what's called a treatment-related fluctuation or TRF, as I said. The only way to distinguish the two is give the patient another dose if there's been a clear decline. And if they respond again, then watch them for the next three or four weeks again closely. Beyond eight weeks, if there is evidence of continuing disease activity, then you're sure that this is now CIDP presenting acutely, so ACIDP, and you would carry on managing them that way. Next question, any other B cell agents can be used as treatment? Uh, not at the moment, there, there may be some trials coming soon. So rituximab is the one that is uh, currently at least, uh, at least used in practice as a um, second line agent when either IVIG or plasmapheresis don't work. Generally, that's when the question comes up. Or of course, if there's a suspicion for nodopathies or uh, anti-magnuropathy, you may think of rituximab as a first line option. The pathophysiology of why steroids don't work for ARDP. No, I do not know what uh, what this is. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of literature uh, trying to explore this, but no, we don't we don't know exactly why steroids do not work for AIDP. Um, a, a a theoretical. Uh, I I don't want to venture uh, venture uh, guesses here. No, we don't do not know exactly why that is. Um, how can one distinguish focal CIDP from plexopathy? So this can be this can be difficult if the plexopathy is of a demyelinating form, and focal CIDP can cause a plexopathy by itself. So it depends on the pathophysiology. If we are talking about plexopathies like neuralgic amyotrophy, you would look for relative preservation of sensory um, of their sensory exam with minimal sensory symptoms, although there may be some sensory findings on the electrodiagnostic studies. Whereas with focal CIDP, you would expect both symptoms, signs, and electrodiagnostic findings to be both sensory and motor. Experience with AZT, yes, it's it's one of one of my two first line options as a uh, as an add on. Uh, when weaning off of IVIG and or steroids is unsuccessful, I add either uh, azathioprine or mycophenolate as uh, an adjunct option. Last uh, next question. In a patient with known CIDP and has been weaned off treatment, if you still see demyelinating features on nerve conduction, including conduction blocks, and not just evidence of axon loss, Will you restart treatment even if with no significant clinical weakness? So the short answer is no, but this is a really, really interesting question. So there are we, we now have multiple ways of looking at nerves, right? One is functionally, which is the electrodiagnostic study, but also ultrasound. Now, ultrasound has looked at nerves in patients with CIDP years after uh, they have been stable from the disease. Uh, and also, interestingly, in AIDP, which is thought to be an acute uh, acute event, and you would expect there not to be too much nerve inflammation and enlargement. But surprisingly, patients with both CIDP and AIDP have been reported. Uh, we don't have data on exactly how frequent this is, but they have, uh, even in AIDP, there are reports that nerve enlargement may persist for an indefinite time after the acute event. So the short answer to would be use uh, 
either persistence of conduction blocks, where you may think, well, if there's onion bulbs and nerves are enlarged and the myelin hasn't healed properly, there may be conduction blocks. There may also be conduction blocks if the nerve is now inexcitable at the sites of these large enlargements, which can be, uh, they can be segmental. So the segment you're trying to stimulate may be very large and inexcitable, whereas distally, maybe it's not. So it can be hard to distinguish the two things. The thing to go by is clinical progression, either by power grading or by um, CIDP scales that uh, like the INCAT. Next question, will CSF protein normalize in patients with CIDP after treatment? It may not, again, by the same logic. Uh, you may expect it to go down perhaps a bit, uh, but it may not normalize. I don't think we know enough about it since we don't do spinal taps on patients with CIDP. If they, if they respond to treatment, there wouldn't be a reason to check it. So I don't think we have enough data. But uh, judging by the other two things that I just said, that nerve conduction abnormalities and uh, structural abnormalities on ultrasound may not normalize, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that perhaps the CSF protein will stay somewhat elevated, maybe not as high as when the disease was active. Will a borderline CSF protein elevation be sufficient to indicate active disease process? It, uh, in fact, is insufficient to, uh, to confidently make the diagnosis of CID, CIDP to begin with. So it's far from indicating an active disease process. I, that's that's uh, That probably should not be the one variable that sways you either towards or away from the disease being active or not. I think the better judge would be the clinical progression and if possible, objective worsening on electrodiagnostic studies. So that would be a better, uh, better indicator of disease activity. AZT as monotherapy. I have not used AZT as monotherapy for um, CIDP. I know that in India, uh, that I, I did inherit some patients who had it, but I ended up switching them all over to, uh, to IVIG when I was there for a couple of years. I do not have experience with monotherapy. Great. Thank you for all the questions and thank you all for listening. This, this, was, this was great. And uh, thank you again to the AN for uh, having us present. Thank you, Dr. Kumar Swamy, and thank you, Dr. Logan, for jumping in for this talk today. Uh, for everyone else who is still here, thank you for asking questions. Please keep an eye on AAN social media, where we will be posting this to YouTube for any sort of review or curriculum usage. Uh, we would also like to point out, too, that we do have a neuro panels on this similar subject later this month. You can find that in the chat I posted uh, to the AAN.com to register. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day.